All right. So let's go ahead and start. Probably other colleagues will start joining in a minute or so. Welcome to this uh, knowledge dissemination dialogue uh, webinar. For us, we changed the, the, the schedule. So now we do it twice uh, a month. And uh, one of them is run uh, uh, in the afternoon, hours afternoon in Central Europe from three to four. And uh, so we changed, we are still all thinking that we were at lunchtime as it used to be, but we changed it to accommodate different regions, time zones. And uh, so thank you for joining. And it will keep being that this one more in the morning. Uh, the next one will be in the morning. Uh, towards the end of the month, morning in Central Europe, and in the afternoon, this one. So welcome, and uh, thank you, Francesca. Francesca will be our uh, speaker today. She will address this interesting topic of corruption and the AMR. So I'm very much looking forward to it. Let me put in full screen. Um, Francesca will be addressing the uh, relationship between corruption and uh, uh, AMR. And Francesca is a public health professional, just finished her master's in public health in the UK. So it will be interesting to share with us what she has learned. A couple of housekeeping rules. Um, please keep your microphone on mute. Uh, rename yourself with your name and organization. And uh, please note that the views presented in this case today by Francesca are her own uh, opinions and not necessarily FAOs. If you post something on the chat, refrain from this is your company and any commercial product or brand. And at the end, we always ask the speakers to make their presentations relatively short, about half an hour, and then uh, to have a dialogue. That's why the name of the webinar series, to have a dialogue at the end. And uh, please post your questions in the chat and uh, the speaker will try to address them. I'll read them out and then Francesca will uh, We'll address it. Also, keep in mind that this meeting is being recorded, and afterwards, we always share the the link in our dissemination channels. So please uh, keep that in mind. Don't worry about the the presentations and the materials. All of that is shared afterwards. So uh, just enjoy the knowledge that Francesca will will share with us. So that's it from my side, Francesca. Thank you for making your time available for us. And uh, floor to you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Georgie and Dr. Pintoferia, actually. Uh, let me go to uh, my PowerPoint and start that presentation. Yes. OK. Uh, can you guys confirm that you can see my screen? Perfect. OK, so I'm, as Dr. Pintoferia said, I'm here to talk to you about um, my, my summer project for London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, which is about corruption and AMR. And this project, the idea for this project, actually sparked from a conversation that um, I had with Dr. Pinto Ferreira and um, that I thank very much for allowing me to be here and present my research findings. Um, I'm a medical professional, and other than Dr. Pinto Ferreira, credits for this project go to Dr. Minakshi Gautam, which is a professor at the school that uh, she's been an excellent supervisor for um, this year. So let's start. As everyone knows, AMR is a complex problem threatening worldwide public health. Currently, around 1.27 million people are affected by resistant pathogens. Poor management of antibiotics drives a positive selective pressure toward pathogens that are antibiotic resistant, which will make it harder to treat infectious disease as antibiotics are becoming less and less effective. But overuse of overconsumption of antibiotics is just one way of driving AMR, for which there is actually an evidence of a dose dependent relationship, meaning that to a given increase in antibiotic consumption corresponds a proportional increase in antibiotic in antimicrobial resistance. However, antibiotic, antibiotic resistant pathogens uh, can also be acquired through two other pathways, the direct spread of resistant pathogens from humans to humans or to animal to humans or from animal to animals and environmental spread, which is basically through either hospital wastewater or sludge wastewater that could be used as fertilizers. The relationship between AMR and antibiotics is not a perfectly linear one as it lacks backing from observation that reveal a higher proportion of AMR in various low and middle income countries, despite lower per capita antibiotic consumption compared to high income countries. This highlights the fundamental contribution of contagion and environmental spread in driving AMR. All these three pathways, so overconsumption of antibiotics, environmental spread and contagion, 
are taken into account into the five pillars of antimicrobial stewardship, which address both the appropriate use of antibiotics and the intervention to prevent infections and environmental spread. Precisely, the five pillars of AMS are establish and develop national coordination mechanism for antimicrobial stewardship and develop guidelines, ensure access to and regulation of antimicrobials, improve uh, awareness, education, and training, strengthen water sanitation and infection prevention and control, and surveillance monitoring and evaluation. These pillars are essential to reduce antimicrobial resistance because they are their aim to prevent the spread of multi-resistant pathogens and maintain the efficacy of existing antibiotics. Delving deeper into what causes AMR, determinants are next. To briefly explain what determinants are, I chose this image that shows men from a village that keep falling into the river. Villagers keep throwing life buoys at them, but unless they remove the slippery stones upstream the river, they will not prevent the fall. Acting uh, upstream, in this case, removing the stones instead of downstream, which is um, which are basically the life boys, enables the prevention of diseases and not just the cure. Determinants of health are often structural elements of society, like socioeconomic conditions or political situations. Um, for my project, I conducted a quick preliminary review, and I found that the upstream determinants of AMR are healthcare per capita expenditure, temperatures, health systems quality, and corruption, which is a determinant that I went on to explore. Interestingly, one study from the quickly preliminary review reported a positive association between corruption and AMR. So the higher the corruption, the higher the AMR. I found more ecological studies reporting a link between these two. It is worth mentioning though, that they were carried out, this kind of study, the ecological one, they were carried out in high income countries where population level data are abundant and available. So corruption hinders uh, efforts to combat AMR, but we don't know exactly how, which is what I aim to do with my piece of research. But exactly what is corruption? Corruption is a critical concept that is related to the adherence to legal principle and societal standards. For my study, I took on with the definition of corruption being the private gain at the public expense. It encompasses both uh, illegal forms of corruption, such as fraud, informal payments, theft of drugs, run, the grand corruption, bribery and embezzlement, and also non necessarily illegal forms, just like conflict of interest. Corruption in healthcare practices exist in both low in and high income countries and occurs in all domain. But healthcare is particularly susceptible because of the nature of the patient provider relationship, which is characterized by the asymmetry of information. But going back to the mechanism of action, how does corruption influence AMR? My hypothesis was that corruption may impact AMR by disrupting the strategies of antimicrobial stewardship and undermining their efficacy. For instance, there is evidence that antibiotics are being sold in unlicensed drug shops or by untrained personnel in low and middle income countries, and that healthcare personnel receive informal payments in exchange for unnecessary drugs or treatment which is likely to impact antibiotic use. In the same way, if personal protective equipment is stolen from hospitals, it could make it harder to control infections. So to summarize, the objective of my study was to identify corruption mechanism that hinders progress in tackling antimicrobial resistance, which have not yet been documented in literature. More specifically, I went on to explore which corruption manifestation acts on which pillar of AMS and which forces drive it and what are its possible solutions. So I only had three months to complete the summer project, so I had to find a methodology that allowed me to quickly review the literature without it being a full on systematic review, because first of all, I only had three months again, and it was just me looking at the, at the literature. Um, I was not, uh, so a quick word about inclusion criteria. Um, I was not expecting many studies to be here, to be there in, um, in the, in databases because of the topics. Um, so I included most study types, um, excluding commentaries, conference papers, preprints, and retracted publications. Always due to time constraints, um, I only focus on human subjects, leaving out animals. 
and I chose to exclude papers that were reporting um, manifestation of corruptions that were perpetrated by people that weren't aware of cause and harm. The reason for this is that for corruption, to fit the definition of corruption, there needs to be a transaction between private gain and public expense. And although one could argue that such transaction still happens, even though um, the people that perpetrate it are unaware, I was still more interested in manifestations that were aware and deliberate. Once done with the systematic um, uh, research, I uh, ended up having two big clumps of studies, the quantitative, made up of mostly ecological studies, and the qualitative one. Quality appraisal and data synthesis were performed using different tools according to the study type, which has been challenging because it really doubled the process. Qualitative studies were appraised using the CASP tool and analyzed using the rapid best fit framework analysis, which uses a deductive approach of mapping data from the included studies onto a framework, in this case, the five pillars of antimicrobial was my choice. For quantitative studies in that, instead, I used the access tool for quality appraisal and a narrative synthesis approach because outcome and measurements were comparable, even though they were still too heterogeneous for me to make a meta-analysis. Meta so now onto results. Here you can see a Prisma diagram, which basically synthesized my systematic search. I, uh, my systematic search lasted two weeks. I uh, explored five databases and my, um, the final pool of, um, the initial pool actually of, of articles with around, was about 811. Then it was after the duplication, so after removing the duplicates, and um, it was uh, reduced to 541. After the first screening, um, it was 71. And then the final number of articles was around 25. I performed quality, um, I performed quality appraisal, but I had to include all 25 papers, even though um, the quality was not so great, especially for reviews and, um, and cross-sectional studies. Um, a bit of study characteristics, a bit of demographics. Um, so uh, most studies, so the qualitative studies accounted for 40% of the total, followed by ecologic studies at 24%, cross-sectional studies at 20%, and reviews at 16%. Most articles centered on research conducted in Asia, around 48%, and Europe, around 20%. Just 12% focused on African countries, and the rest either did not specify origin or had a global scope. Most studies, 60% focused on low and middle income countries and 24% focused on high income countries. Most studies investigated the link between corruption and antibiotics uh, access and regulation, around 56%, followed by corruption and AMR in general. The studies were mostly conducted in the community and the qualitative finding paint a rich picture of the daily menage of community pharmacies, informal drug shops and private practices. Okay, so now let's delve into the meaty part. These are the results from the ecological study that used population level data to study the relationship between AMR and corruption. Um, I, most of the time, uh, indexes were used to estimate AMR and corruption. Overall, all the studies pointed in the same direction, that there is a strong association between antimicrobial resistance and corruption. And specifically, there is an inverse correlation between the indexes of control of corruption, governance indexes, and corruption perception indexes, and the various antimicrobial resistance indexes, meaning that for every improvement of the former, there would be a decrease in the latter. The strength of this inverse correlation seems also coherent, in almost all studies, an improvement of the corruption index of one unit will cause a reduction in the antibiotic resistance index of around 0.4. The most interesting part of the study for me was the qualitative analysis, which provided descriptive accounts of various forms of corruption, each affecting one or more pillar of AMS. So overall, the manifestation of corruption that I have identified are over-the-counter sale of antibiotics, the influence of pharmaceutical industry and education and training, conflict of interest, counterfeit drugs, payment of cash to state official, and regulatory capture. Unfortunately, the systematic search found only papers ascribable to the first three pillars of AMS, which are establishment of national guidelines, antibiotic access and increased education and awareness. And I could not find any manifestation of corruption linked to pillar four and five. 
So here I will present the findings for each pillars of AMS involved, starting with the first one, which is to establish and develop coordination mechanism. Um, only two qualitative papers reported on how corruption impacts the first pillar. Both studies were recent and reported data from low and middle income countries. And both mentioned corruption related barriers to implement the WHO led AMR National Action Plan or NAP. The first study was carried out in Pakistan and discovered that policymakers were actually reluct reluctant to endorse restriction on powerful professional groups such as doctors or pharmaceutical companies, whereas they had no problem in casting them on informal drug sellers. The authors pinned on powerful healthcare lobbies, the lenient regulation on antibiotic prescription, which then impaired the implementation of AMR and NAB. The second study was instead conducted in Myanmar, and the authors uncovered complex connection between regulatory agency, state officials, and informal drug providers. These latter provide easy access to antibiotics to the population. State officials are aware of this. Nevertheless, some of them require bribes to turn a blind eye. The reason for this seems to be ascribable to their insufficient government salaries, and the government, in turn, tolerates the bribes because it avoids them raising the pay of their officials. Both studies suggest that global policymakers should increase the involvement in the local national context before implementing policies to avoid, promotion, pro, to avoid promoting an overprescriptive, almost, almost one-size-fits-all policy. Going on with the second pillar, which is to ensure access and regulation to antimicrobials, this one grouped the majority of the studies retrieved, and a manifestation of corruption identified where the over-the-counter sale of antibiotics, counterfeit drugs, and conflict of interest, which we'll explore one by one in more details. We'll start with over-the-counter sale of antibiotics, which is defined as the sale of antibiotic without a prescription. Most of the studies reporting it were predominantly, again, LM, uh, LMIC-based, and authors identified two main driver, drivers. One, ascribable to the demand, so on part of patients, and the other one on the offer, um, on, on part of, of drug providers. These two pull and push forces are synergic. The push is the growing demand for antibiotics from patients who do not want to consult a physician because of how resource intensive it is. They need to accommodate time and money, travel long distances, miss one or more days of work, pay for the doctor consultation, and also for the full course of antibiotics. So they will rather go straight to the pharmacist slash informal drug provider and ask for antibiotics. The pool is the fear of losing clients if the antibiotic is denied from doctors or drug providers. Losing clients means decreased revenues for drug shops and pharmacies, a condition worsened by the high market competition. Several authors believe that this is fueled by the meager salaries earned by formal and informal drug sellers. In between these push and pull forces, there should be the regulatory hand of the government that protect the citizen from exploitation using laws and regulation. However, these laws are reported to be lacking or not even uh, enforced, or even sometimes they uh, seem to fuel the uh, market competition. Um, counterfeit drugs, which is the next manifestation of corruption associated to this pillar, are drugs that are deliberately and fraudulently mislabeled with respect to identity and source. Two studies, I found two studies that were linked to these manifestations, and in both uh, the studies that were carried in Benin and Laos, almost 60% of the SA drugs were not compliant with quality requirements. Um, even though, in both cases, the author could not determine if the low quality of the drug was attributable to faulty substandards or decay, or, decay, um, or actually was attributable to falsification and counterfeiting. Counterfeit drugs being sold in drug shops and pharmacies is actually a, a, an important concern for uh, medical professionals and health, uh, and health workers. Um, as reported in many studies. However, they also, uh, the professionals also report to be aware that even uh, registered drugs could be faulty in some standards because they think and the, they think that the quality, the quality checks are not, um, are not actually in place. As a matter of fact, some drug sellers reported that they did not believe they were harming patients by selling them unregistered drugs 
but rather they were providing an equal level of service for just a smaller price. A key driver identified by several papers were the high tariffs and, and, and taxes that, that were put on registered drugs in low and middle income countries, which led to increased drug cost, driving uh, down incentive for supply, causing a subsequent scarcity of antibiotics, which is a condition exploitable by counterfeiters that can fill the gap in the market. Other structural drivers are the excessive reliance on the international supply chain, which often evades the stringent regulatory supervision of the national supply chain, and the lack of quality assurance programs. Um, some solutions that were identified to combat this problem um, was criminalization of falsified medical products, which is a very downstream solution, and the strengthening of the structural flaws in both the supply chain and improve the quality checks. Moving on to the last manifestation of corruption for this um, pillar, we, we find a conflict of interest, which occurs when personal, um, when personal interest uh, interacts with professional obligations. Hospitals and pharmaceutical in, uh, industries often ex exert pressure on providers by incentivizing the sale of antibiotics, jeopardizing the capacity of a provider to make an unbiased decision, and this happens all over the world. For example, medical representatives are rewarded. This this is an, an example that came from my um, from my from the papers from this review. Medical representatives are rewarded based on the number of antibiotics that they, they, they are able to sell, and to increase their sales, they share their rewards with drug providers. These relationships gave them access to other networks, which in turn helped them expand their business opportunities. Similarly, they also try to incentivize prescription of antibiotics by providing doctors with sponsorship to Congress or gifts. Of course, there is no obligation for them to sell the given drug, but it is a very important, not subtle, not so subtle way to influence a prescription. Regarding the drivers, the studies have identified again, poor salaries of doctors and drug providers um, as main driver, together with a lack of protective regulation and high market competition especially in low and middle income countries that see uh, that there is an, an significant out-of-pocket healthcare expense and private hospitals. The natural proposed solutions was to deco decouple the incentives from sale targets to increase ethical practice and to increase also quality controls. Now we are at the third pillar of AMS and uh, the corruption manifestation that, we're, that I found to be associated with that. And this uh, pillar is to improve awareness and um, education on AMR. So in this, um, uh, in this topic, I only found two studies, uh, again, both uh, conducted in low and middle income countries that dealt with the topic. Um, both studies identified corruption as the undue influence uh, by the pharmaceutical industry on drug provider education in formal and informal healthcare. Controlling education on antibiotics can lead to biased prescription, uh, to biased um, prescription, favoring uh, overuse and misuse. Um, the examples that were given uh, from uh, these two papers was that pharmaceutical company representatives uh, were often the single source of new knowledge, especially for informal health providers. As they, all, as they often organized meetings, conferences to promote their products among local drug providers, especially in remote areas. From both papers, um, transpires that one of the major drivers is the lack of widespread institutionally provided training, which is independent from pharmaceutical interests. And of course, one of the solutions that were suggested was to actually provide such training. So this is coming to an end. And here I tied all of the knowledge coming from a systematic review in this logic model. If you see uh, on the left column under the inputs, um, these are all the drivers um, that are color coded depending on the frequency of retrieval with insufficient protection law or enforcement being the most common driver that I found throughout the papers. And they are categorized into uh, three groups. So socioeconomic conditions, government and healthcare structural flaws and emerging private interests. Each of them is then linked into the activities, which uh, are the manifestation of corruption that I was able to fetch, and that are linked to the AMS, um, to the five pillars of AMS, which are then directed 
toward one or more mechanism of acquiral of acquiring um, an, um, a resistant pathogen or genes, which then leads to antimicrobial resistance. What this logic model shows is how the structural feature of a country create a fertile soil in which manifestations of corruption persist. For example, poverty is a significant factor that often forces people to prioritize their basic needs over uh, seeking medical attention. Patients in these studies only sought medical help when their conditions were severe, viewing a doctor's visit as a luxury they could rarely afford. Spending money on medicine or food was more critical for them than visiting a healthcare provider. They believed antibiotics are the only cure that could help them recover um, and return to work in order to supply their family. Antibiotic consumption seems deeply entangled in the daily life of people living in low and middle income countries, and most of all in rural areas and informal settlements, because it is connected to the ability to work and survive in an equitable place. People actually broker their emancipation from an unjust environment through antibiotic use. Before concluding, I'd like to point out some a couple of limitations that I had during this, um, during actually uh, doing my research. First of all, um, there is this big data gap uh, of a low, of data that could be retrieved uh, from lower and middle income countries, which was mostly which were mostly qualitative and high income countries because um, high income country studies were mostly ecologic and focused on the relationship between corruption and AMR uh, because they had population uh, population data that are routinely retrieved um, because they have high capacity for research while we don't have the same in low and middle income country. That, um, that actually impairs both the research capacity and the data that we're able to get from low and middle income countries and also impacts my external validity, the external validity of this study, because the results from this research may only be applicable to low and middle income countries. Also, the quality of studies was not always great. Um, ecologic studies and qualitative studies fared better and had higher scores than reviews or um, cross-sectional studies. And also I'd like to point out that since I am a researcher coming from a Western countries, I might have, um, I might have uh, actually uh, read the, uh, the accounts coming from low and middle income countries through a Eurocentric and Western uh, lens. So to, to wrap it all up, I have some take home messages from my research, which I think are fitting. Um, Corruptic practices in the use of antibiotics in low and middle income countries seems to be filling the gaps left by the government and institutions. Fighting corruption will need to account for country specific dynamics rather than one size fits all plan, because the use of antibiotics is deeply rooted in the socioeconomic fabric. Also, there are important gaps in research, and I think I advocate for qualitative studies um, to be done in high income countries to retrieve the same kind of breach accounts from uh, those countries. And also a review with similar objectives to this one should be carried out in the food and environmental sector to uncover further mechanisms on corruption that in their AMR and have the full picture. That's it for me. Thank you so much for your attention. And I am open to answer all questions that you shall have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Francesca. Great presentation, very clear and very interesting. Many of us do not work in these topics. And we don't necessarily think about this connection. So it's great that you made us put pieces together that we usually don't put and think in systems and you went from the salaries of officials to counterfeit drugs. So I found it very, very interesting. And it's not surprising that it triggered many questions in the chat. And I have a couple of myself, but let's first address the one that came in the chat, and then we go to the others. Uh, the first one uh, was on the sample size. And I guess in this case, it will refer mostly how many, bring forth how many papers we looked at, because the basis of your study was the, the, the literature review. So the, the question was, how much is the sample in total you addressed in your survey? I guess in this case, it would be about the, the paper that you included. You, you explained that if you could cover that better. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so um, the papers that I included 
uh, overall were uh, 25. Um, if I can go back to share my screen, I can go back to the Prisma diagram if you if you want. Let me go just back here. Can you see my screen? Not yet, but maybe oh. now. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Now I can see it. Okay. I'm gonna go back to the to the the slide in which I had my Prisma. Yes. There it was. Yeah. So um the, the 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 included studies, the overall included studies were 25, but um overall the one that that, that I could include because they were they also um they were also they, they, they would be includable after the first screening, they were 70, 71. But then I had to um I went into the full um I, I screened, I screened them with the um, using the full text and then they were not fitting. So um it was around 20. Then I had to exclude, I think the inclusion criteria that, that was more uh, strict was the one um, regarding the intention of people perpetrating a manifestation of corruption because I excluded those papers in which people perpetrating corruption was not aware. So for example, they were selling antibiotics, but they, did, they, didn't, they, did, they didn't know they were harming patients because of AMR. They didn't know they were fueling antimicrobial resistance. So I think that if you include them, um you might have a higher number of, of studies but still it was um there wasn't there was not much literature on the topic at all thank you 25 uh, great and being biased i fully agree with your next uh, suggestion of next step look at one's book on food and animal production being fully biased being a veterinarian that will be interested in looking at that side so let's uh, move on into the the questions that came up in the chat one question, are the quantitative studies solely based on correlation? So a question on correlation of your studies. Yes. Um, yeah, so the quantitative studies that I was able to gather, first of all, they were um, they were all, they, they gathered data from Europe and they gather routinely collected data, so population level data, um, both for from AMR and um, and for and for corruption, corruption, and both AMR and corruption were not like, um, of course, directly measured. They were um, estimate from indexes, and they were not, uh, especially from AM for for corruption. They were um, govern. There, there were indexes coming from the literature, so it was not um, because it's it's not really measurable as for now. Uh, corruption. Um, I had I I found cross sectional studies, but they were um, survey based and they were more qualitative than quantitative. So yeah, so the strong quantitative part was mostly um, based on correlation and they were mostly uh, ecological, which we all know that this kind of study have a lot of studies have a lot of um, fallacies. Great. Thank you, Francesca. The, the next question is also on the, um, the correlation. So asking if the New York study you only investigated correlation between the corruption index and the AMR, or you use some more refined metrics like uh, the antimicrobial use per kilogram of biomass or the amount of counterfeit drug sales. So if you look at the, the correlation between corruption and AMR or other uh, metrics like AMU per kilogram of biomass or the amount of counterfeit drug sales. No, I only uh, found the cor I only found papers talking about corruption indexes and AMR indexes, not even just AMR in, in general, just or, or like, for example, I don't know, um, the burden of the burden of AMR. No, just AMR indexes and corruption indexes. Um, regarding counterfeit drug sales, it's really hard to find papers um, that uh, give you a number uh, because I found these two papers um, that uh, that literally took samples of drugs and put them under uh, put them into uh, the assay um, into the assay uh, machines and to look for the the, the quality of the, of the of the drug and um, but that's it I didn't I couldn't find like many papers talking about counterfeit sales which I think is really interesting because um, I read that there are lots of emergencies especially in the, the with one happening in Nigeria with kids. Uh, dying from counterfeit drugs. So I think it's an emerging problem um, in this country and it has been for a lot of time in uh, low and middle income countries. Thank you very much. Uh, let's One um, interesting about the interviews, I guess you addressed because, I mean, it really triggered a lot of interesting questions and follow-ups 
One, maybe you had this in mind. A colleague is asking if the study includes interviews about uh, on the manufacturers about counterfeit drugs. So I, I'm assuming that it was basically the literature review. But if you thought about that, including interviews with the manufacturers or, uh, about the counterfeit drugs. Um, no, it didn't. So literature review um, did not. So basically, I, I found some interviews of drug sellers providing counterfeit drugs, but that was as far as the, the, the researcher or that primary study went. She did not, or she or he did not uh, find any other, um, she did not find uh, any other manufacturer of, of counterfeit drugs or any other uh, person involved with the counterfeiting. I think it would be very interesting to ask them about, um, about uh, to ask the manufacturer about counterfeit drugs also, to um, understand, um, to understand, like to have more insights on how they try to, um, they, they actually escape the quality checks and and, and how to how they they are able to insert their lots in the in the markets because it is I think one area which has been not uh, discovered yet. So many people, many authors were saying that they are not really able to understand like how this uh, big lots of counterfeit drugs enter the markets without being um, without being checked at all. Um, yeah, we have been doing some work on that thing. We did a pilot in Ethiopia. And uh, one of the reasons why it hasn't been much study, it comes with many, many challenges to, to, to put together the, the, the purchase of those drugs and the testing of those drugs. It comes with significant challenges that we were somehow aware when we started, but it became even more when we tried to do it. But we, we keep moving. But it's it's that's one of the reasons. It, it there's, there's endless challenges to actually analyze those drugs and get to the results. But very good point on token and falsified. Um, next, uh, um, if uh, your work, if the review has already been published or if it's on the way or how are you in the public, which it usually takes some time between the work and the actual publication till you actually have the PDF. When you have it, you usually go out for dinner to celebrate. So tell us how you are in terms of the publication. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still, I'm still, um, I'm working toward it, but uh, I've been busy the last few months, but now I will work toward the publication of this manuscript as, as soon as I can. I'm really Perfect. eager to publish it. Yeah, it's been a lot of work. Awesome. I think there will be many people interested in uh, in uh, reading it and further working on it, which is uh, great. And that, that's one of the purpose of these dialogues is always to trigger collaboration, collaboration between the speaker and FAO and colleagues and the chat. And uh, that, that's the goal of this, to trigger further collaboration of interesting work like, like yours. Um, next question, in the case of counterfeit uh, due to weak postmark of surveillance, should we solely blame it on corruption, as you highlighted, or just low budget allocation by government? So I guess the question is, why do we have counterfeit? Um, that's the, 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 yeah. the question, the, the weak postmark of surveillance or corruption or low budget allocations by governments to fight this issue. Yeah, I think the um I think what is interesting of this whole work is that corruption is not something to uh blame at the end of the day, but it's a way that people find to actually broker their emancipation and how it's a way for them to go on with their life and survive because they're already embedded in a in a fabric which is really um unfair so um corruption corruption is just one way that they can use to survive in the case of counterfeit drugs um i think so counterfeit drugs are a part like our manifestation of corruption right and i like the 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 studies that were um that that i found in my research in my research uh, piece were actually blaming um we're actually blaming the high market, the, the, the high taxes uh, on drugs, so that were not um, that, that did not drive the incentives of government to actually have to actually to actually stock on antibiotics. So there was a scarcity of antibiotics in that particular um, country, and because there what there weren't enough um, antibiotics, and the one that were in the pharma in the pharmacies were actually costing a lot of money, uh, that created a gap. So counterfeiters filled the gap by inserting uh, unregistered drugs being sold mostly by unlicensed drug shops. So I think that um, counterfeit drugs are surely a manifestation of um, when a government, of a government being falling short on something. 
Very good point. Um, speaking about government, the, the next question relates to the national action plans, national action plan on uh, AMR. And so the question uh, is, how do you see the impact of your study, of your literature review, related to the implementation or open operationalization, that's a big word, of a national action plan. So many countries are now, most of them do have a plan, the NAP, most of them have a plan. And I'll say most of them are already implementing them. Some are struggling with the funding, which is a common problem. They, they might develop one, but they struggle to find the funding to implement it. But how did you ever think about that? The, the connection between your result and the four countries are implementing or even revising the national action plans on AMR? Yeah. Um, so um, the, the 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 WHO led AMR NAP um, had several uh, several uh, recommendations for 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 countries and one of them, is, for example, to um, create a technical group. Right. So I see this as being a, a technical group and actually uh, try to find some uh, leverage in the government to actually strengthen the governance. And I think that is quite tricky um, for low and middle income countries because this. As as long as we stick to the results of my um, of my of my research, um, the problems is really uh, some, sometimes lying in the government as it, itself, which are uh, not improving the salaries of public officials like doctors and ph pharmacies, which is itself giving incentives for these professionals to um, promote over the counter sale of antibiotics. So. Um, so yeah, I think this could be a big problem if you talk about strengthening governance and actually involving government representatives and then um, actually having them not to talk, like you have to have them not to talk about AMR, but first of all, you have to talk to them about giving incentives to people that are actually working in the front line of healthcare to be able to, for them to, to engage in ethical practices. Um, because then what's the purpose of having them talk about AMR if you don't um, address the structural uh, flaws that you have uh, in, in the government? And also, for example, there was um, another suggestion from, from, the, in, from the NAP um, that is, um, again, the funding. If you don't allocate like you need to allocate funding for AMR. Um, you need to allocate funding for um, for people to be able to to do it, to promote education awareness. But then then again, like uh, what can we do if if they're not allocating funding then to the to the subsidization of of antibiotics so that um, they don't have antibiotics that are um, that are sold in 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 a, in a good amount in farm in in pharmacies. So I think it's a problem of um, structural like for at least for the low and middle income countries they should revise their um the, not that I sh they should revise because i'm no one to say what they should be but the finding from my uh, research um, they're aiming at saying that um probably um global policy makers and in should engage more in the local uh, environment before um writing up uh, a policy that it's global all right very good. With the next one, you might want to share again your screen because yeah. you had a good slide addressing it. If you could please repeat how you defined corruption. Uh, is it a deliberate behavior to deceive or defraud? And uh, if you looked at the relationship between trust and corruption, so either you can just address it or you might want to share your screen because yeah. I think a specific gonna... slide. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, uh, so this is the slide. Let me share it. Mm -hmm. can find it yeah so uh this is a slide and i defined i use the definition of the private gain at uh, uh, public expense so basically the, i use this transaction between um something that is private so my own private interest and something that is paid by the public so i'm uh, prioritizing my interest over the common the common good basically um and um what was the question again other than this one your definition your the what was your definition of uh, uh corruption and if you look at the relationship between trust and corruption uh definition between trust and corruption no i didn't um 
I didn't look into the trust and corruptions, which I think it would be very interesting because most of the accounts uh, coming from positive papers were actually uh, saying that they did not trust the government, especially when it, come, when it came to counterfeit drugs. Um, the same health professionals that were condemning counterfeit drugs were not putting trust in registered drugs because they did not believe the government was able to provide quality checks on, regis on registered drugs. So I think that would be, um, that is an, an interesting, uh, an interesting question. And that's why I think that it would be interesting also to have uh, accounts, qualitative accounts on corruption coming from high income countries, because it's also, it's always a taboo topic to talk about corruption in high income countries. While I think that, um, I think that you, we will see in the future that in countries where the government is trusted the less, uh, there will be um, a higher uh, levels of corruption because we don't, we just don't trust each other. We just, we just don't trust the government. So we, we will find our own ways to survive, which is probably illegal. Good. Thank you, Francesca. The next question, uh, if you maybe in the literature review, if you, I mean, your focus was clearly the corruption and the EMR. And the question from the colleague, if you have, um, how do you think results that you found would align with similar studies on corruption and uh, other health issues? If you come across some studies on that corruption and other health issues, not AMR, other diseases, or any other link between health issues and corruption. So no mm -hmm. AMR, but other corruption and other health issues. If you if you came across some papers on other health issues, not AMR. Um, I think that I saw a couple of papers um, focusing not on 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 AMR because in my preliminary. Uh, review and um, in there is this general association with corruption and worse health outcomes, um, but in general, and that's also coming from ecological studies, which have the fallacy of being ecological. So um, you just see the bigger uh, the bigger picture. You just see the bigger um, association. But if you uh, if you delve deeper, then you might see different things. Um, but I did not explore a specific like a specific health issues, uh, just the overall outcomes. And I think that that's the trend. More corruption, worse health outcome outcomes. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Francesca. A question about and, and the, the geographic, the, the different geographical areas and the different geographical results. And it was very interesting that you highlighted the limitation of your study. We see it, both of us, for example, are European, so we would see it, read the papers with that angle, which is by default bias as much as we try to control it. So there was a question of, of that. Did you see any uh, differences between geographical areas, for example, Asia versus Europe? I wish I could compare them, but unfortunately I don't have data. I don't have in my review studies, ecological studies coming from Asia, nor I have qualitative studies coming from Europe. So I can't really compare the two. I only have qualitative papers for Asia and I only have ecological study from Europe. And that's a big gap in knowledge because we shall start collecting, uh, we shall start like collecting, uh, making, doing interviews uh, on corruption in Europe so that we have the same amount, the, the same kind of knowledge and we, could, we can actually compare them and uh, actually try to understand which are the underlying determinants and mechanism that fuel um, corruption and, uh, of course, and determines the uh, worse health outcomes and worse uh, AMR in the areas. Thank you. There is also a question on, um, and I think this is a broader, for example, how do you improve the health systems so that people do not have to turn into informal markets, the issue about counterfeit drugs or even expired drugs? So I think you touched about a bit about that on the incentives, for example. But the question is that how how do you think from your literature review we could improve the health systems so that people do not turn into the informal markets where they might find the expired or counterfeit substandard drugs? I think that's one million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just thirty yeah. seconds to answer. <laughs> Thank you for the trust, but <laughs> um, I think that. Uh, I don't know, it's, it really comes down to poverty, to fighting poverty in, in some case. So I think before uh, trying to strengthen health systems, I think we should we should focus on combating poverty and um, trying to tackle the 
fabric of the of a country in which corruption lies because once you um fight poverty and once you make sure that people are uh, living in a, in a uh, dignitous way, in a dignified way, you actually start their health, you, you start seeing their health outcomes improve. And, um, and also, yeah, incentivizing people that are working in a frontline healthcare, because um, they're the first defender of uh, the health systems. And if they don't believe in what they're doing, it, if they don't engage in ethical practices, then uh, there's going to be less trust on them, less trust in the government. They're not going to believe the drugs that we will be giving them. And, and it's going to be just a cascade. Uh, so I think fighting poverty and then surely incentivizing um, the, the work of first-line healthcare workers. Great. The next one is, um, if you have, uh, I think you addressed some of these, but maybe you want to emphasize some points or maybe address it. But potential recommendations for medical regulatory authorities, uh, in this case, in low and middle income countries and their impact on AMR. So it will be the question on recommendations to medical regulatory authorities. I think you addressed some of this by speaking in general about governments, you know, not just medical regulatory authorities, but if you want to address it, then you can address the question. Um, yes, so one of the solutions that were proposed by, because I think it's about counterfeit drugs, um, the, the one of the things proposed was a very downstream solution, which was the criminalization of um, of counterfeit drugs, which I think uh, it's not in place in many countries. And that was one of the main uh, issues that authors were uh, stating. Um, but I think it's very downstream. I think, again, we should try to strengthen uh, health systems by improving quality checks and by uh, trying to uh, subsidize um, drugs that are so uh, important as antibiotics. And by subsidizing them, we allow um, pharmacies to be able to sell them properly under uh, their prescription, but uh, for a price that is actually affordable by many people so that you, you don't just have to, um, to go uh, and go buy it uh, from, an, from an, um, a, a provider that is not uh, registered. Thank you, Francesca. So I'll take the last one before we, we wrap up. And out of the, and I know that you focus, you very clearly said and explained very well that you focus on human uh, papers, human related literature. Uh, just to see, maybe your colleagues that are listening to us would like to follow the other side or one of the other sides on the animal. Do you recall when you did the first literature search, were there some other studies on on animals, the environment, uh, use of antimicrobials in plants? Was there some literature that you intentionally exclude because you had to make selections, you had to make choices? Or did that did that come across some results or not much? It was it really just humans that you came across? I think they were fairly a good amount. That's why I had to exclude them. I would I would have loved to include them, but there was a fairly a, a good amount of um, corruption practices uh, with animals. And because this project only has only happens around across three months, I could not include them uh, because alone alone they wouldn't they wouldn't have made um, a whole systematic review. But with that, but um, with them, it would have been too long. But I came across them, especially uh, for um, sludge, uh, sludge um, wastewaters used as um, fertilizers. So for an environmental uh, sectors and for for animals, um, the use of antibiotics and um, I think uh, the one that that were inserted in the, in the food for animals, I think it was one of the big deals. Um, and yeah, it would have been so interesting to complete the picture and have these two other uh, piece of the puzzle so that we can understand how um, how everything goes. And I, I could, for me, I could complete the logic model and have, have it all on one piece of paper. It would be great. Perfect. So who knows, you might have the chance to follow up or other colleagues listening to us uh, might, be, might be willing to reach out to you. And I'm sure you'll be knowing you. I know that you'll be willing to, to get in touch with other colleagues and provide some guidance. I think you learned a lot from your literature with the methods that you used. And uh, if colleagues are interested in now following up on the animal side, I'm sure you'll be willing to, to collaborate and uh, support and guide. So that's it. Thank you very much. It was excellent, Francesca. Very well done. Very thankful for you to, to take time to present to us your results. And we have shared in the chat the, the feedback, the, the questionnaire feedback for the, the, the questionnaire uh, to let us know uh, um, what we can do. What, for example, the idea to change the schedule came from the, the feedback uh, questionnaire. So it's very much, and we hope that, for example, our colleagues in the Americas, this schedule 
it's a bit better. And as I said, the next one will be on uh, February 27, and it will be 9.30 a.m. So in that case, the colleagues in Asia might be a more decent time to, to connect to connect in uh, working hours. So please do feel, uh, feel in that. And you can, for example, suggest different topics and different speakers. The goal is that uh, the colleagues mostly working, we call it data in a broad sense. It can be a literature review like Francesca so well presented today, but colleagues that are out there in the regions, in the fields, in the countries, making completely different uh, works. And we have addressed uh, a broad range of topics uh, all related to EDMR. So we are very thankful if you can complete that form and let us know how we can uh, improve. So that's it. Thank you all for joining. And thank you, Francesca. I wish you all a very good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.